Our final um, keynote speaker for tonight is the founder of one of the founders of Tangosol. He joined Oracle in 2007 and is one of the architects behind Coherence. We have chased this guy for five years now. And finally, I present for you Cameron Purdy. Thank you. I'm not used to speaking so late in the day. I got to both sleep and recover from last night's um, technical sessions. Um, technical. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about C++, .NET, and Java. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but there are, there's an entire track dedicated here to uh, languages. And this is a, a pretty, fun, pretty fun topic. Uh, if, it's not just this conference, this, um, this bubbling, if you will, going on in the industry of, of, of innovation in, in the language and in VM space. It's pretty exciting, you know. It's it's almost like I, I feel there's 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 going to be an egg coming out of that chicken before too long. Um, you know, there's a a lot of work going on and a lot of a lot of ideas coalescing. So it it almost feels and maybe maybe that next big language is already out there. You know, I I, I went by and and saw the the closure talk before this. That was great, except I got confused by all the the parentheses. So he kept on like simplifying the code. He'd say, you know, we can get rid of this, we can get rid of this. I was thinking, well, we, could we get rid of the parentheses? Um, unfortunately, my keyboard didn't have parentheses, so I, I never got to learn Lisp. So uh, this um, this particular talk, if if you're if you're hoping to learn something, you probably came to the wrong keynote. But there's only one, so you're stuck. Um, this particular talk is is taking a number of experiences that I've had over the past, I guess, 15 years uh, with a couple different languages. Notably, um, you know, before I worked with Java, I worked with C++. Um, and then uh, it took me about an hour after downloading the, the beta for, for the first JDK uh, to know that I was never going to go back to C++ again, which of course I was wrong about, because uh, after we ended up having a fairly successful product in, in Java, um, all these banks said, well, we want it to be in C++ too. Uh, and in the meantime, Microsoft released this language called C Sharp, um, what used to be called Project Cool. Um, and uh, in the meantime, we ended up with implementations in all three languages. And so um, I learned a whole bunch, you know, watching, watching it at a project level, watching it at a product level, and looking at the technology. And at some point in this process, you know, having all these language conversations with customers and things, I, I started to realize that there were some really obvious lessons that if we look back, you know, we kind of cheated ourselves out of, of learning these things as we went through the process of you know, of Java growing in the industry and, and you know, it was quite a, a rapid, quite a rapid ascent. I mean, Java went from unheard of to uh, basically the number one language in just a few years um, in terms of, in terms of that, that level of language development. And, uh, you know, people would say, well, it was Sun's marketing. I can tell you, knowing Sun, that it was not Sun's marketing. Um, I'm not sure that Sun has marketing, other than people making fun of them at trade shows. Um, so, you know, what was it? Why did, why did that emerge as, as, a, as a relatively dominant language in such a short period of time? And why wasn't C++, you know, fit for purpose, if you will, in, in that age of application development? So that's what this presentation is going to look at. And uh, I start off with a little bit of, a little bit of humor. Um, some of the humor got clipped out of this by our PR people who, who, who didn't appreciate all of my humor. But... Uh, this is Java in the eyes of a Java developer, right? You know, it's steady evolution of, of languages, you know, from uh, machine code to assembly uh, to C to C++ and to Java. Of course, if you ask someone who works in C++, so how many people here still work with C++? Okay, so I'm going to offend you. Um, so sooner or later in this presentation, probably. But uh, the, uh, one of the things I'd like to say is, you know, if you don't agree with me, that's great. And if you do just agree with everything I'm saying, then you're not thinking hard enough, right? There, there, are, a lot of, there are a lot of subjective opinions, and, and you're going to have different experiences because the requirements that each language is designed for, it suits a, a particular problem set. There's a reason why C++ uh, was the number one language 
uh, in this in this tier of languages was the number one language for a while. And before that, there's a reason why C was so dominant. You know, um, whether or not your Graham or whatever that guy's name is, Paul Graham, who you know he he doesn't understand why Lisp isn't the dominant language, and um, he probably still thinks it will be someday. And I have I know all six small talk programmers, and and they don't understand why. Um, why it's not the dominant language, because you know, it, it did everything that every future language will ever do, and it did that 10 years ago. Um, how about Java in the eyes of a Ruby programmer? So this is, I couldn't help putting this in because you know, the boilerplate that uh, Ola likes to make fun of. Um, yeah. <laughs> so what I wanted to start with is taking a look at a set of reasons why Java succeeded. So, you know, it comes out in 1996, JDK 1.0.2, um, you know, and it was beta software, basically. I mean, it barely ran. Um, there was no swing. AWT was jokingly called Arthur wants to because, you know, one guy in a month whipped it up and threw it into the software. Um, so we're going to take a look at 10 reasons why Java actually grew up and, and uh, became so so successful so quickly. And just to be clear, you know, everything I'm going to say here has some caveat to it. You know, you can't put all the disclaimers into every slide because there's just not enough room. So, you know, for example, I know that you can do garbage collection in C++. There are various products and libraries and this and that for it, but C++ itself doesn't have it. And it will have it maybe someday, but it really won't matter. We'll see why. Um, so if you, you know, every, every one of these you can argue, and that's fine. You should argue, but uh, here we go. Number, number 10. Garbage collection. So why was garbage collection so important? Why would I actually list this first? Automated garbage collection. If you look at C++ code, if you tear it apart and measure by lines of code what does what, um, there's an analysis back in the mid-90s that I read that said over 90% of C++ code is related to error handling and garbage collection. Not garbage collection, I'm sorry, error handling and memory management. We didn't have garbage collection. That means that if you had 1,000 lines of code, 900 of them were spent doing stuff that you just don't have to do anymore. Um, so just massive amounts of code. But I don't think that's actually the reason, right? I don't think that's why garbage collection was important. Because if 900 lines of code being boilerplate were a problem, Java wouldn't be so successful, right? It's not the amount of code reduction, actually. Garbage collection did a couple things that, looking back, were absolutely instrumental for the success of the language. Garbage collection allowed frameworks to exist. Without garbage collection, there's no standard contract for how one part of the system written by one person and another part of the system written by another person, one of which died 20 years ago and another hasn't been written yet, how those two things will work together with shared resources in such a way that there's no memory leaks, that they can pass them around back and forth, and when it's no longer needed, it'll be cleaned up. I remember back in C and C++, you know, you had to have things like handles, because you couldn't pass a pointer, right? You had to pass a, a handle, and that way they could tell you when you could free it, and you could keep track of everything you had allocated in case they forgot to tell you, so that you could keep that list of handles and things like that. So cross-component memory management was enabled by having automated garbage collection. So when you ask the question, you know, why are there so many frameworks in Java? Maybe it's the wrong question. Maybe the question is, why was it so impossible to build frameworks in a language like C++? Um, obviously, the last point is pretty valid, too. Being able to eliminate 90% uh, of the code and have uh, garbage collection just work automatically um, meant much faster time to market and much, much lower error counts. And we'll look at another side of that in a couple minutes. Number nine, the build process. So we have, as I mentioned, we have three, three different implementations of our, our client software for our product. Um, and so we have, to, we have to build all three of these. And in Java, it's a single ant task. We just say ant, you know, clean build dist or something like that. And we end up with a, with a jar and we're all done. C++, oh, and by the way, that takes seven minutes on my machine. C++ takes 20 hours. Oh, actually, it's 40 hours, because I have to build debug and release, right? 40 hours, it used to be 40 hours. We've, we've gotten it down a bit, but it's still uh, ludicrously long. Um, you need a second build, because the same binary doesn't contain both uh, debug information and uh, optimized code. Um, and lastly, the tooling 
uh, in the Java space for things like builds are uh, incredibly advanced. Now, you didn't have all of this on day one with Java. So again, why could Java be successful? The, 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 I think the lesson to take away here is that it broke up the problem of having to build things into a much, much uh, simpler, set of, simpler set of problems. No separation of production versus debug code, for example. Um, uh, very, very few number of artifacts produced uh, from, from the build process itself. Let's take a look at source code. Um, I actually get really frustrated when I switch from Java to C++ uh, when I'm working, working on the code. In fact, all of our developers have to uh, program in Java, C Sharp, and C++ because if they do a fix, for example, in one language, it has to be ported to the other two. If a feature is added in one language, it has to be ported to the other two. And every time I switch to C++, I'm looking for something and I can't find the code. It's because it's not actually in the file because you have two files. You have a header and you have a CPP, so a .hpp and a .cpp. And the reason is is because the organization of the source code is actually reflected by the runtime characteristics of the system. You have to declare everything that could be called in the header, the HPP, and yet the implementation file is a CPP. But if the implementation is only in the CPP, it can't be inlined, which is how uh, C++ uh, obtains uh, fairly good performance uh, is through inlining of code. Uh, so the end result is that you're going through a code file and you're looking at stuff and it's like suddenly there's, there's code that you can't find. It's in some other file. Um, that's just an example. Uh, but if you look at uh, from the build process, for example, a massive number of artifacts, and these artifacts as well are specific to a particular platform. These are all things that Java completely eliminated. And this is almost a, a sub-bullet of the previous two. I mean, if we stop and think about what these last two things were getting at, we had a build process, and we were looking at actually managing both the source and the artifacts that we're producing from it. And the big takeaway was actually having a binary standard, being able to give you a chunk of bytes that'll run on any platform, contain all the debug information you need. Um, you can even, you can, you can load it at runtime, you can introspect it, you can find out what the API is from it. All the information you need in a, in a single artifact per class, uh, per class source code. Um, so that's what we call a binary standard. Um, C++ has no binary standard. That means you have to compile every bit of source on every bit of, and on every single platform. In fact, it's quite often worse than that because even minor changes uh, to compilers, you'd have to rebuild uh, everything. So if you're supporting multiple versions of a compiler, you typically, just for safety, have to build completely from scratch. Um, Pre-compiled headers, uh, again, these are all compiler and, and platform specific. Um, C++ requires a large amount of source to be shipped, so we actually have to provide um, half of our source code to our customers just so they can use the software because we have to provide the header files to them that uh, enable them to call those functions. Um, all of this stuff, Java defers to the runtime, all the linking aspects of it, et cetera. So, so the Java compiler is actually staggeringly simple in terms of what it actually has to do to convert source code into a binary form that can be deployed. Uh, let's take another look. Dynamic linking. So this is a side effect of having a binary standard. Once I have a binary standard, I can now take that binary and at runtime link to it, even if I never intended to link to it. So take an application server, for example. Um, how many people deployed to Tomcat? That's quite a few. Now, how many of you had to call up Apache and get them to change the Tomcat source code so it could load your apps? And I didn't think so. That's called dynamic linking. That's something you can't do in C++. Um, now, again, there are caveats. There are actually ways to do this in C++. Each platform, each, each implementation is different. No binary standard, but it is, it is theoretically possible. This is something that, with garbage collection, enabled frameworks, for example, enabled application servers, what we think of as containers, um, so, uh, and eliminated uh, a lot of what we associate with the term uh, DLL hell. Now let's look at number five. Portability. Um, so everyone has probably heard all the jokes about write once, run anywhere. Um, but we actually support um, the mainframe, both Linux and uh, OS 390 on the mainframe. Uh, we support Macs and 
PCs running Windows and Linux and Solaris on x86 and uh, Spark and we support uh, what used to be called OS 400. I forget what they call it now. Um, so IBM's kind of an alphabet soup of uh, computer and operating system names. Um, and we do it all from a single code base. Now, it doesn't mean that there's been no headaches. So, for example, on the mainframe, uh, we ran into an issue because the uh, default, the default uh, page, code page for uh, text on the mainframe is, is different than from, from everything else. So it didn't know what to do with config files that were actually packaged inside a jar. Right? So you have a binary format for the classes, but you don't actually have a binary format for text. Who'd have thunk it? Um, I mean, think about which of those should be easier, right? A binary format for running code or a binary format for writing Mary Had a Little Lamb. Um, portability in C++. Now, with C++, we do support, let's see, we currently support, believe it or not, Mac OS X, because that's what all our developers use, uh, Windows, Solaris, uh, Linux, AIX, and a couple others, I think. Um, but it was, it was actually quite a, we had to build, if you will, almost a VM in C++ to provide the portability. Like we had to redo everything that came out of the box with Java um, just to be able to write code that would run on multiple platforms. Uh, and for those of you that still work with C++, I hope you get to use Boost because it would prevent you from having to do a lot of that. It's as close as you get to um, a class library in C++. Uh, unfortunately, um, while there are plenty of commercial applications that use Boost, you'll never find a commercial library that uses Boost. In other words, if you own the main, if you own the startup of it, you can say whatever library you want. But building a framework, you have to be able to support a system that someone else is using the same library. And again, that reintroduces that whole DLL hell where the version of Boost suddenly becomes uh, extremely important, which eliminated, uh, we weren't able to use it. Um, lastly, or not lastly, next, a standard type system. So Java comes out of the box with a standard type system. Things like int, 32-bit, signed, little, little, is it little or big, Endian uh, integer, whichever one Intel didn't do. Um, <laughs> you know, the bytes get, get ordered backwards between uh, Intel and every other chip out there. Um, Boolean. I mean, like, what does if operate on? A Boolean. I mean, it's really obvious stuff. S even string. Even, how about, um, how about socket? I mean, things that we just take for, uh, for granted now. When Java came out, on a lot of platforms, you still had to buy a socket library. Right? Back in 1996, there were platforms that you had to go and find a third party who wrote a socket, uh, socket implementation for it. Look at C++, what does it have? It has no standard type system. There's no, int means different things on different, different platforms. So you didn't even have uh, the most basic things standardized, let alone things like hash table, vector. Later on, Java introduced the whole collections framework. None of that existed in C++. Um, today, there's something called the standard template library. Well. Um, I've, I've used it before, and basically every release of it broke whatever we had before, so we, we got off it pretty quickly. Um, number three, reflection. Again, this is one of the huge reasons why frameworks took off. This allowed systems to look at code that they had no anticipation of ever running. Like You didn't have to with Hibernate, for example. Hibernate can look at um, code that it had no idea would ever exist. So it gave us the ability to create frameworks in advance of the things that those frameworks would be supporting. It means that two parties can come together you know, through a combination of this, of this uh, set of libraries that comes with the platform, um, a binary standard, and the VM. It gives, us, it gives us the ability to look at, at runtime, uh, the compile time aspects of what's being executed. It allows us to manipulate objects that are arbitrary. Uh, it allows us to set properties, uh, call methods, uh, access fields, construct these objects. And these are the things that almost every framework that you download and use, uh, whether it's an application server, whether it's an ORM, um, these, all, these things all rely on, on reflection. 
So again, uh, you know, maybe the question isn't so much why are there so many frameworks for Java, but look at it a different way and say, here's a language that finally enabled frameworks to actually exist. Number two, this wouldn't normally be in people's top 10 list for why Java is significantly, uh, well, was able to beat C++. Performance. So how many people think Java is faster than C++? Just let's see some hands. How many people think C++ is faster than Java? I'd expect about that. There's some mixed opinions. How many people have no idea? All right. Well, the ones with no idea are wrong. Well, you can't really be wrong. If you have no idea, you have no idea. But C++ is faster than Java, significantly faster. And Java is also significantly faster than C++. So you, you give me a problem, I can look at the problem, I can look at an implementation and generally tell you which one's going to be faster. Um, but there are certain areas where Java is just extremely, extremely good. I'll give you a couple examples that we learned about. Thread safety, just a little issue. Anyone here have more than one concurrent thread running, maybe two cores in a, in a, or more than one? C oh, wow. Anyone have like those two dollars, two hundred dollars? Um, not two hundred. You don't. You don't have dollars here, I guess. Anyone have those two hundred euro netbooks with an Atom processor? Yeah, that's two cores. Okay. How about like uh, you know every every computer you buy now has at least two cores. The new Intel chips are running eight concurrent threads, so four cores hyperthreaded. Right. Um, when you run Java code and you rewrite the same thing, either using boost, smart pointers, or the C++0x thing, which is like the next major iteration of C++, um, the code is actually three times slower with multiple threads in C++. Why? How could it be three times slower? And the reason is, is because the decision for thread safety in C++ is provided by the compiler. The decision for thread safety in Java is actually provided at runtime by the VM. And most of the time, the VM does absolutely nothing. So that 3x performance difference, if you did it just single-threaded and got rid of the thread safety, C++ is a little faster. But once you have multiple threads working on shared data structures, the hotspot optimizations, for example, completely eliminate all uncontended synchronizations um, and, and optimize uh, you know, nested synchronizations and things like that so that basically the bare minimum amount of work is done. Um, so this is pretty staggering because we, we were doing some tests and our C++ stuff wasn't performing and we couldn't figure it out. And then finally we realized when we scrapped it all and we basically took hash table from Java Util, implemented it in C++ using Boost, and it was three times slower. And we're like, oh, maybe it's not our fault, right? Um, maybe it's not. Also, inlining. Uh, early on, the first clue that, that Java would have an advantage here was with a cryptography library uh, where um, basically you could plug in different codecs, if you will, into this cryptography library. This was like 10 years ago um, that I was reading this. And, and what they found was it was faster in Java than C++. Nobody could believe it at the time. I mean, that was ridiculous. How could, how could a, uh, a VM-based language be faster uh, than C++? Uh, and it turned out that it was because there's so many levels of virtualization that Hotspot would simply collapse completely in line um, that something like uh, plugging in a codec could be much, much faster uh, in Java. Um, and lastly, um, the last point I'll make on this, we're not going back ever to single core chips. Right? The next iteration of chips will probably have around 16 cores on the server side, um, probably running 32 or more threads in parallel. That'll be you know, commodity hardware for a thousand bucks. You'll have you know, 64 concurrent threads running. Um, pretty amazing, right, if you think about it. Uh, because uh, just 10 years ago, that was a million dollar machine. If you got an E10,000, which was 64 concurrent threads running very, very slowly, um, top speed I think at the time was 360 megahertz. Uh, and by the way, that's a risk system, so compared to Intel, that would be about 150 megahertz. 
Um, you had 64 of them, and that was a million dollars. Now you're going to have 64, and it'll be a thousand dollars. It's just a, it's 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 mind-boggling. So things like support for concurrency uh, become extremely important. And lastly, safety. So this um, this I think was was a, a huge reason why the move to a web-based infrastructure, move to web-based application, um, was huge. Uh, there was a, a security report that came out recently on, on a very, very common piece of software that you can download and look at documents on your computer. Um, and one of the things that, I'm not saying any names, um, one of the things it mentioned was there are over 10,000 uncorrected buffer overruns. Over 10,000 uncorrected buffer overruns still in that software. Um, now, it doesn't mean that they're all a security hole. It just means that they have 10,000 things they still have to fix. Uh, Java just eliminated pointers, just gone. That issue of being able to accidentally look at memory you're not supposed to look at or overwrite memory you're not supposed to be able to write to, it just completely disappeared. Um, now, you can still crash a JVM, but it's usually the JVM's fault if you do so. It's either the JVM or native code or an act of God. Pick one. Um, no buffer overruns and bounds checked. These two things uh, ended up making it safe for hosting code in a shared environment. Uh, because before this, if you could take control of a desktop, you were only taking control of one person's machine. But if you could take control of a server, you were taking control of, of a shared, every customer was going through that, through that server. So from a point of view of, of safety of infrastructure, uh, this made it possible uh, for an application server to exist. Uh, previous to this, um, everything, uh, everything was uh, hand-coded from a security point of view. And a crash of a single thread within an application server, if you think back to um, C++ applications running web applications, it would take down, typically would take down the entire application. And I actually had 11, so I wanted to add one more in there. And uh, unfortunately, it was a top 10 list, so we made number 11. All right, everyone's still awake? Ah, yawn. Ah, you guys are really sleepy and quiet. All right, C++ templates. Um, now, this was, uh, well, at least for me, a relatively new feature of C++, which is probably a bad sign because it means I've been using it for a long time. Um, but C++ templates basically allow the same thing you can accomplish with generics, but they allow it in C++. So, for example, I can have a map of something to something in, in C++ using a template. And what happens is the compiler, when it compiles it, it takes that code that I wrote and it sticks it in a buffer somewhere and it replaces all the parts of the template that say T with something else. So it's a giant cut and paste operation. Um, now, Bjorn Strustrup didn't appreciate my explanation of this. Um, uh, no one likes to hear that their baby's ugly. Um, but uh, when we first started building our C++ library, it was 80 megabytes. It was an order of magnitude or more larger than our Java binary. And the Java binary contained 10 times more functionality. Um, so, and this was a side effect of, of the templates. And when it comes to the advanced features of templates, what's called metaprogramming, um, I've actually been lurking on a couple of discussions on the internet. Um, sorry, George Bush, Bush joke for you. Uh, on the internet, where the, um, the only person that could actually come in and explain what was happening was Bjorn himself. So if you need the language designer to come in and tell you how something works, it's usually a bad sign. Um, and for those of you who don't know what fugly is, I'll give you a hint. It's a contraction of two words, one of which is ugly. <clears throat> But now let's be fair, right? Because we've just looked at like 10 really good reasons why Java was applicable for building systems that had to run, you know, 24-7. Although, as we know, there are a lot of reasons why systems don't quite stay up 24-7. But they have to run in a shared environment. So they multiple multiple users on the same system. Um, they have to be secure um, or securable. Um, they have to be able to integrate you know, lots of different code, different frameworks to be able to build them and roll them out on time. Um, you don't want them leaking memory and taking the server down, all those things. So we looked at a whole bunch of really good reasons why Java 
probably had a had an advantage in that market at that time with the features that it provided. But now let's be fair, let's take a look at the other side of the coin. So C++. And, and, and just so you know, even though I'm kind of making fun, tongue-in-cheek tongue -in of a lot of C++ stuff, you know, if I, if I you know, there's, there's absolutely nothing to be ashamed of in terms of C++. I mean, for its time, it was, it was a, an incredible, uh, incredible leap forward. But at each, you know, at each iteration, we can look back and understand what the mistakes are or what the limitations were of, of previous technologies. So let's take a look, though, some of the reasons why uh, C++ should have been a better fit. So number one, startup time. So if you, if you look hard enough on the internet, which should take about three seconds on Google, um, you can actually find examples where people you know, do bake-offs on performance and they create micro-benchmarks, and they show that C++ is somewhere between 10,000 and a billion times faster than Java. It's not that hard, right? All you do is you write a C++ program that adds two and two, and you do the same thing in Java. You run them both. Which one's faster? Well, they actually both add 2 plus 2 in about the same period of time, zero, right? And C++ takes, you know, a millisecond to start up and quit. So the total run time for C++ is a millisecond. How about for Java? Well, let's see. Uh, Java space, you know, my test, uh, enter. Right, okay. Loading the JVM. Oops. Uh, I've got a main function. All right, I've got, to, I've got to load this thing that has a main function that takes string. Ooh, I've got to go find string. Okay, we'll load that one. Oops, got to parse that, validate it. Um, maybe pre-compile it into native code. Oh, string mentions something called character. Oh, got to go get character. Ooh, look, it has all these arrays of things in it, you know, for different code pages. We'll initialize all those because it's a static constructor. Oh, someone mentioned something about IO stream. Let me go find this uh, java.io. We'll load that one. No, that links to that. If you put verbose on whatever that setting is in the JVM where you can see what classes it's loading, it's over a thousand classes to run two plus two. Now, I'm a little bit wrong technically on what the VM is actually doing as it loads those classes. The hotspot guys really were upset when I was talking about this. So just to be fair, it doesn't actually do the security validations on the code in the Java runtime.jar because um, it assumes that it's all safe. There you go. Uh, but from a startup perspective, you know, if you're using it in a Linux-like way where you're, you know, doing something, piping it to 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 something, and writing Perl, you end up you know, with something that runs in a tenth of a second. And if you do it with Java, that would be two minutes because of the cumulative startup time cost. So this is not good for instant and short-running processes like web servers. Oh, wait. Oh, shoot. Okay, okay, we'll go to the next one. Number nine, um, memory footprint. That was me before the diet. Uh, Let's take the 2 plus 2 example. I start it up in C++ and I run it and I'm looking really closely. I put an integrated, you know, I use ICE debugger or something on it and I'm looking and it allocates, you know, two 4K blocks for the stack and it allocates, you know, 8K for some frame or something, 16K and it's done. Well, that was easy. Let's take a look at Java. All right, it starts up, it's taking its one or two seconds to start up and it has a footprint of five and a half meg to add two and two together. Um, why? Well, because, first of all, there's so much necessary for that minimum set of functionality. But secondly, all those top ten features we looked at for why Java would actually have an advantage, they do have a cost at runtime. And the cost isn't necessarily performance. The cost is that there's more information available at runtime. The, the JVM itself is tracking what's going on, keeping track of how many times a method gets called, because once it hits 50,000, it's going to really super optimize that, right? It's keeping lists of this, and it keeps the byte code. It, keeps, uh, it has native code that it's generating on the fly, and it's doing all these things in memory. Uh, plus, like in the 2 plus 2 example, I start with a minimum of 1,000 classes being loaded just to run that. Um, so... You know, if you don't have lots of megabytes, like, you know, say on the iPhone, it only comes with uh, half a gig now, I think. Um, so if you don't have lots of memory, um, you know, this just, this just wouldn't work out. Um, so, for example, on a, on a server where you might only have 64 gig of RAM. Oh, wait. No. No, that's not it. All right, let's go to number eight. Full GC pauses. So with, with Java, you have a shared global mutable store. Um, anyone know how to implement an immutable object in Java? Raise your hand. Um, 
Okay, well, you'll have to tell me afterwards because I didn't think anything in Java was immutable. You can even set final fields. Um, so I'm not sure how to do it myself. But um, you could probably, if you had no fields, it would be immutable. <laughs> okay, I was wrong. Um, so the fact, though, that it's a shared store, it's a, what we call a heap, right? Um, you got this, this giant heap of stuff, and all these threads can read and write from it, from any place in it, right? They can, they can change any object at any time, basically. Uh, which means that if we want to move those things around, what we'll call, for example, compaction, if we want to squish it down and make room for other stuff, we have to tell all the threads to stop. It's like, well, guys, I, I'm working on this part right here. I've got to squeeze this in, make some space. So all the threads have to stop. This is what we call a full pause GC, or a hard stop, right? It's just going to uh, stop, and then it's going to go as quickly through and do everything it can, and says, okay, everyone can go now, right? The problem is, as the size of that heap grows, this actually does that, that tiny, you know, that tiny period of time where it has to stop all the threads, that tiny period of time can be 90 seconds. No, not usually. And the GC algorithms are pretty impressive now. If you look at what Hotspot does with the, with the parallel concurrent GC stuff, if you look at the uh, JRocket VM with its, its real-time uh, option, I mean, there's pretty impressive stuff going on in GC. But at the end of the day, even with hardware support, take the Azul case, for example, there's a 10-line program that Gil Teen, the CTO of uh, Azul, wrote that will cause the Azul box, which has hardware support for concurrent uh, pauseless garbage collection, you can cause it to lock up in a GC for 90 seconds, right? Now, it's not a program that you'd be running in production, but it shows that there actually is, uh, you know, there, there is a case where even, even if you have the hardware and you can build the hardware, you still can't eliminate this issue, right? So for real time, this does actually, without a lot of care, this does eliminate Java as a true... Uh, real-time system. On the other hand, from 1996 when Java came out to 2009, you know, we went from a typical processor being, you know, 100 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. And I got to tell you, 30 times performance improvement makes this pause a lot less painful, right? So a lot of things that Java couldn't do at all 15 years ago, or whenever it came out, 13 years ago, um, it, it can now do. And in fact, at the time, in 1996, a lot of my friends were saying, well, you can't use C++ for real-time. You can't use C for real-time. You've got to be kidding me. Right? But now, you know, why not? Um, you, get, you get a lot of benefit from getting 100 times, 100 times faster on, on processing. Um, so in this case, it's really a mixed bag. There are going to be systems that Java just won't be applicable for, even on the, on the server side. But generally speaking... Generally speaking, uh, this did not eliminate Java uh, from uh, being used for this type of application. So this, this move to the web. Number seven, no deterministic destruction. Um, so there's a, a, a trend uh, over the past few years called RAII, which stands for RARE. Um, this is an approach to building software in C++ called resource allocation is instantiation. Did I get that right? Does anyone know what it means? Um, it basically means that in C++, when you allocate something on the stack, if you forget to put the new keyword when you create an object, it's allocated on the stack, not in the heap, right? The equivalent of the heap. And that means when you return out of that method or you leave the current scope that you, that you created that object in, it fires the destructor, even if an exception is thrown, you know, in some nested method. So as C++ unwinds the scopes, for example, from a, a long jump for an exception or something like that, as it unwinds those, it calls all the destructors of the things on the stack, which basically means you can do the equivalent of try finally um, very easily in C++. Just by having that object on the stack, as it leaves scope, whether by normal execution or by exception, it's going to be able to clean up all the things that all the resources allocated there. Garbage collection doesn't do that. In Java, when you knew something, it goes away maybe when it leaves scope, or maybe five minutes later, or maybe never. Right? A finalizer isn't guaranteed to be run. Uh, and if you do add a finalizer, you're going to slow your product down. So for example, I, I added one finalizer once to one of our classes, and it slowed our product down by 15%, because as soon as you add a finalizer, it disables a lot of the garbage collection optimizations because the objects associated with finalizers have to immediately go into the tenured heap. If you didn't understand that, 
that's okay, neither do I. Um, that's what they told me. <clears throat> and then they took my keyboard away. <laughs> now, in C Sharp, just to be fair, C Sharp has a using keyword. And, and what this does is, is C Sharp has, as part of its type system, as part of its intrinsic type system, it has, has a concept called iDisposable. Um, which has one method called dispose. It's kind of like clonable has clone. Oh wait, it doesn't. Um, so iDisposable, if you take an iDisposable object and say using iDisposable blah blah blah, at the end of that using, it calls that dispose method. So that's very similar in some ways to uh, what you would do with RAII. Uh, and you could do the same thing in Java. And in fact, we probably knew this six years ago, but still don't. Um, I did hear actually that it's probably coming in Java 7, the, the using keyword, but who knows. Let's see, number six. Oh, well actually before we move on, this wouldn't actually prevent a uh, working application obviously, but it is, it is something that is, it is actually fairly nice to be able to accomplish this. So, um, you know, it's nice, you don't have it in Java, you do have it in C++, but I don't think it's a compelling enough reason that would have prevented Java from being used. Uh, number six, barriers to native integration. Well, this one's actually pretty big if you stop and think about it. Because in C++ or in C, you know, all the APIs out there are built in C. Right? They're just you know, C decl or Pascal based calling convention. You, know, you push some stuff on the stack and you, you do a, a call instruction and poof, you're running something else. Right? So all those APIs are expressed in C. C++ can easily call them. C can easily call them. In fact, almost any language can easily call them except for Java. Why not? Well, in Java, we have something called JNI. It's the Java native interface. And you know what's a Java native interface too? The native code that you write to be called from Java. That's it. That's the only thing you can call. So you're forced, in, so there's an API you want to call? You want to call it from Java? You have to go write native code that calls that, and then you can call that native code from Java. Um, so this actually is, it's at least a pain in the butt. It's at least a negative one uh, on the Java side. Um, well, I actually ran out of things, so that was that was five. <laughs> I'm sorry if you thought you paid for ten, uh, you have to get a refund. Um, I honestly couldn't really think of of anything else. I mean, there were there were, and if you look at if you look at what happened, if you if you stop, like I love the languages, I love the technology, but if you stop and think, was it marketing that made Java applicable? Was it you know, what was it that caused um, Java to take off like a rocket and uh, C++ to sink like a rock? Um, and the answer is shift happens, right? There was a fundamental shift in what we were doing as an industry, what our customers were requiring from us. Um, internet and the World Wide Web, right? So how many rich client applications did we have to build to support web apps? Any, anyone have an idea? A browser? One? Um, okay, so we'll let, we'll let Opera into this as well. That's two. Uh, Microsoft wants to own it. That's three. Um, Netscape will go out of business and uh, we'll build Firefox. That's four. Uh, and Apple will make a half-working implementation of a browser. That's five. Okay, five. For how many apps? Oh, 200 million. That's not bad. It's a pretty good ratio. We need five C++ products. Oh, plus the JVM, I guess. But I mean, there's, there's not, there, there just isn't that demand for um, high-speed, native, client-side, uh, all the things that C and C++ were good at, like interacting with the operating system, being able to draw stuff on the screen. All those things were no longer necessary for a web application. And on the back end, yes, we could build the application server itself in C or C++. But we were missing all those things like a binary format for what we wanted to host on it. We were missing the ability to introspect and reflect on what it was that we were loading in so we could take a framework that had no idea what a customer and an account and a this and a that were and it could read and write them from a database that it had no idea until it started up what the format of that database was, right? Um, no installation necessary, 
we run an application. We just we, the first time you ever go to the website, it, it works the same way as the last time you ever go to it. In faster iterative development. Now, if it takes 20 hours to build an application, you really want to make sure that you get it right before you try to build it. You know, you don't want to like, okay, I'll change this character. Build, run. That's 20 hours. Oop, messed up. I'll change this character. Um, it, the cost of iterative development in Java was significantly reduced from C++. Significantly reduced. Uh, well, what about scripting languages? So this is interesting. If you think about iterative development, for example, Java, even though it's much faster than C++, C++, C++ it's still, you know, building an entire, you know, running ant to build a, a jar or an ear or a war. There's still a pretty good opportunity, right? I mean, C++ could probably step up and fill that. The only problem is, is in the meantime, that that level, if you will, one step higher uh, on the on the on the language stack, was completely filled by scripting languages. Um, for example, uh, the the memory issue with Java. Let's think about some of its weaknesses. The fact that it needs megabytes just to start up, and a typical J2E application uses a couple gigabytes. Gigabytes. I don't know if 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 yours are like that, but all the ones I see are like that. Um, you know, so if you have a, a shared environment, you want to host a whole bunch of different companies' applications in that one environment. Different applications, different companies, and each one needs, say, let's be really conservative, just one gigabyte, right? That means on a server you can host maybe 50 of them. With PHP, I can host 500, and the server's like, oh, yeah. I mean, the, in other words, the weaknesses that Java had, while they were real weaknesses, while they were real problems, they weren't problems vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, if you will, the, the existing, uh, existing front-runner in, in the language wars. Um, rapid application development, I mean, if you think it's rapid to be able to build something with ant in seven seconds, I mean, PHP is zero seconds. You just F5 and it's there. There's no, there's, there's no turnaround time. Uh, languages like Ruby, I mean, continue this. So you've got, you've got Ruby at the kind of high-end object orientation functional side, and at the low-end scripting side, you've got PHP. The entire gamut of that, that, that range that Java couldn't address directly um, was addressed by an entire new class of languages uh, that emerged at the same time. All right, so now quick, uh, quick discussion of kind of where things are moving forward. And so this is kind of interesting, right? We've just looked at a whole bunch of reasons why Java worked really well for a set of requirements that emerged in the mid-90s um, and became dominant over the next decade. Uh, and it actually kind of makes sense now why C++ wasn't a go-to language for those types of applications. Um, but now let's see, you know, could we actually look forward and predict and say, is there a change happening right now? Is there something happening right now that we could look at the technology that we have today? We could look at Java maybe as the new C++, right? It's got some problems that we're going to fix in some new something, right? We can look at, at technology as being a, a continual set of advancements happening. Can we learn lessons about what's going to emerge in terms of technology, in terms of language, in terms of execution environments, can we learn by looking forward based on the types of things that we've learned looking back? So first of all, uh, from the point of view of a virtual machine, what are we missing? Um, modularity. I mean, if you look at what's one of the hottest technologies in Java today, something being added to Java, if you will, modularity, OSGI, right? This is something that, that, that didn't exist. Uh, I think this is one of the areas that will definitely show up as kind of a core concept of future languages, uh, virtual machines, etc. Life cycle and isolation. Uh, OSGI does obviously address the life cycle part of that um, uh, to a great extent. Isolation though, if I have two applications running in the VM, they're running against the same shared global mutable memory space. Um, so isolation, if you will, is one of the weaknesses uh, today of the Java model. It's probably something that if we're moving to a sh completely shared hosted environment, like a cloud computing environment, it's something that would be desirable. Now there are different opinions on where the isolation will actually come in. For example, it can be at a process level. I can just run 500 VMs. But again, we've already seen the weakness of that. Um, lower memory footprint, same reason. 
predictable GC pauses. So if we're loading up servers and we're using more and more RAM for each of these applications, we have to find a way to eliminate the pause in the application because memory sizes are not getting smaller. I predict that within a year, maybe two years, we'll have customers in production with terabyte plus heaps. They're already in the lab testing it. Um, platform, distributed system as a system. What we're missing for something like cloud computing is an actual full platform that out of the box makes the applications that we're building for it as simple as it was when we got Java and wanted to do our first socket-based implementation, right? Having, having the functionality that we would need in that type of environment just available out of the box. One of the things I like to say about cloud computing is if you know you're building for the cloud based on the API or the products you use, then it's not the cloud. In other words, with, with Java, I didn't have to know what operating system I was going to run on. I didn't have to know which server I was going to run on. Cloud computing is about taking that same level of services that I would need to run on a single server and making it so that whatever I build is manageable and hostable within an environment that I have no definition for, no fixed definition for. Um, obviously, persistence is a huge one. You've seen an explosion of, of you know, the whole NoSQL movement, uh, uh, various, uh, the, the area that I work in, uh, data grid software, key value stores, uh, grid-based databases, uh, with MapReduce style processing, et cetera. Um, just as a, as a summary, Java itself has to step up in the, in the same way. Is it, is it the right technology? Quite, a lot of people think that the JVM itself is a great technology for building this on. Uh, maybe the language um, uh, itself gets left behind. And then just a quick overview of one of the emerging languages that I've been looking a lot at that's, that's attempting to address some of these things. Scala as a language, running on the JVM. Uh, it also runs on the CLR, which is uh, Microsoft's version of the JVM. Um, that was a joke, come on. I had to say at least one thing. Um, so this is a combination functional imperative language, uh, and it's actually uh, quite a lot like I was at the F-sharp uh, presentation today, and it's like, oh, I recognize this. This reminds me a, a lot of what I've been learning about Scala. And I'm going to look at a couple, just two examples that I really like, things that I see as helping contain the complexity of applications as complexity grows. Uh, the first is traits. They're like subclasses, but they allow us to override methods as opposed to just uh, inheriting. Um, and specifically, I wanted to look at what's called a mix-in. It's the ability to take code written for anything that implements a particular interface and mix it into any one of those. So it eliminates both, uh, it eliminates inheritance altogether. It gives us the ability to do things like multiple inheritance. Um, so that's a very, very brief overview, uh, but there's an entire language track if you guys are interested in that going on. Uh, and I have come to the end of the presentation and I'm out of time, I think. So thank you very much.